In this presentation, we will explore the joints and the musculature of the thoracic and lumbar spine. There are 25 intervertebral soft tissue joint segments between the cervicothoracic and lumbar sacral vertebrae. Unlike the cervical vertebrae, the thoracic and lumbar vertebrae have pronounced dorsal spinous processes which are angled in opposite directions, this way, this way, except for T16, which is vertical. In the wither region, the vertebral bodies are deep and around 30 centimetres long in large breeds. They have small interlocking facet joints here to maintain their tight congruency and in the lumbar region, which has pronounced transverse processes, there are lateral joints on the two last lumbar vertebrae here and on the other side. So these are the last two lumbar. There are lateral articulations here and here, and then on L6, here and here, to make an articulation with the sacrum, here and here. A substantial ligament, the supraspinous ligament, together with the facet joints here, binds the dorsal spinous processes together. Spinal stabilizer muscle, multifidus, and the substantial longissimus muscles are present on all thoracic and lumbar vertebrae. The musculature of this region is categorized into epaxial and hypaxial muscles. Epaxial meaning dorsal to the transverse processes or above them to extend the spine and hypaxial meaning they are sited below the transverse processes to flex the spine. Movement is limited in the back but cumulative through all joint segments along the thoracic and lumbar spine to make one gross movement. In the thoracic portion, movement is predominantly lateral flexion, although mostly between T8 and T14 in this region, directly under where the rider sits at the base of the withers, where the potential restriction of the saddle rails and stirrup bars lie. And in the lumbar region, lateral flexion is blocked by sizable transverse processes, although dorsiflexion is considerable at the lumbar sacral joint. Much of the spinal rotation is created by the limbs making cyclical ground contact. Force is largely created by the pelvic limbs and transmitted via the back to the thoracic limbs. Motion is coupled, and this means that the thoracic and lumbar spines work in synchrony in that what one element does, the other becomes involved too. The back helps to set up the posture of the whole body to shape the base of support formed by the limb position. And if the back is compromised by discomfort, the limbs can act to prop the back by placing support under the uncomfortable area. 
The thoracic spine is of course where the saddle is fitted and you can see it carefully mapped out here with an area across longissimus for saddle panel placement, avoiding the thoracolumbar region and avoiding the scapulae rotation and the pink area avoiding the bite region where the stallion contacts the withers of the mare to immobilize her for breeding. An anatomical girth groove is conveniently formed in the lower thorax in the pectoral region, but this does not always correspond with the perpendicular position of the billets or the girth straps, in other words. And this means that when the saddle is positioned on the back, the billets should meet the girth groove and girth position vertically. Thoracic vertebrae up to the thoracolumbar joint require clearance from the saddle gullet channel in order to be capable of functioning. The back of the saddle panels should not interfere with the thoracolumbar joint. For example, if the back of the saddle moves in this region, the muscles of the thoracolumbar region will seek to stabilize it and it can become hypertonic and overdeveloped in this region of the horse's back. Horses fixed in hyperextension of the back when ridden could risk overriding dorsal spinous processes developing, or in other words, kissing spines in this region, which is very painful for the horse. These can occur between T12 to L2, but typically at T13 to 14, where the narrowest of the interspinous processes occur and where rider weight is concentrated. And we can see what appears to be a generous gullet in this picture of vertebrae laid within an adult sized saddles, but those vertebrae are from a small pony. Full size horses have vertebrae twice the size of these. And provision of sufficient vertebral clearance is a major concern for saddle fitting the sport horse, as many can have their performance inhibited by their saddles and riders. Damage to mechanoreceptors in joint capsules can result in altered muscle recruitment patterns and in turn compensatory gait, as observed by Punjabi in 2006. And this means that when joint function is compromised, these joints are incapable of initiating correct firing of locomotor muscles, resulting in compensatory gait, which has the effect of the body being unable to move healthily and which could have a knock on effect of further joint compromise. It's thus very important to nurture healthy movement patterns for healthy joint function in terms of optimal muscle recruitment to protect them. Muscles with attachment to the back are latissimus dorsi, a superficial muscle with its origins in the lumbar dorsal fascia and insertion into the medial humerus. The rider and saddle exert pressure onto this muscle before exerting pressure onto the deeper longissimus dorsi muscle. And this muscle is directly involved in thoracic limb movement by retracting it to facilitate the stride by drawing the trunk over the ground when in stance and adducting it or placing the limb towards the midline for turns. It also flexes the shoulder joint in doing this or for jumping. Spinalis, which is attached as far back as L5, can laterally flex the neck and thorax and when both elements are recruited at the same time, extend the thoracolumbar region. Another important muscle for jumping when neck and lumbar required to be controlled 
for landing. Longissimus dorsi is a substantially thick muscle when sufficiently developed for placement of a saddle over it. Again, this is a lateral flexor of the spine and when recruited bilaterally can extend the spine. It must be carefully developed so as not to be fixed in hyperextension. And this usually means plenty of work without a rider and saddle to inhibit development of it or the effect of placing the saddle almost directly onto a bony surface will occur. Serratus dorsalis is another muscle sighted directly under the rider and is involved with breathing. And now we're beginning to see how a heavy or unbalanced, unskilled rider can impact on a horse's breathing, reducing time to fatigue. The external abdominal oblique assists other muscles with lateral flexion and when recruited bilaterally will flex the thoracolumbar region. Again, if a horse struggles to recruit this muscle, it will affect stride production and overdevelopment of this muscle is not uncommon and indicates muscle imbalance as this muscle can potentially do too much of the work of stride production instead of rectus abdominis which requires sufficient relaxation of the apaxial muscles in order to function optimally. Iliocostalis, another spinal lateral flexor, but which will extend the spine when recruited bilaterally. The pectoralis muscle group forms the ventral thoracic sling together with serratus subvisus and thoracis, those two pairs of muscles suspending the rib cage and base of the neck from the underside of the scapulae. Rectus abdominis is important for stride production, as I just mentioned. And finally, iliopsoas formed from two muscles, but we'll consider it as one for our purposes. This is a hugely important muscle for the sport horse. And you can see how it would work in conjunction with an optimally developed rectus abdominis as an important hip flexor. I believe that this muscle, if the horse is able to readily recruit it for postural support, can place the horse's pelvis in neutral, facilitating self-carriage and that feeling a rider gets when a horse suddenly finds its core and is able to lighten its forehand. Ground pole work with lots of stride lengthening as the theme is essential for postural development. More about this topic in the biomechanics module, but for now, see how important this muscle is for supporting and protecting the floating lumbar spine region as it facilitates lumbar sacral flexion for stride production and how easily the sacroiliac joint can strain if not well supported by this muscle, assisted by adequate control of rectus abdominis. Many saddle fitters believe that saddle pads are unnecessary if the saddle is well fitted, but this assumes that the back musculature is well conditioned to take a saddle and rider. And this really is an issue if the rider is very heavy as back muscle development will be inhibited without a blood supply. Only the muscles can truly protect the horse's back from the rider and this is especially important for young horses that are developing their gait to carry a rider. Unless they are comfortable, they will not be able to use their backs properly. 
and may develop a lifetime of compensatory gait. Let's take a look at the horse's back muscles at work on a water treadmill and consider how the back muscles require an adequate warm up before work. I believe this horse has only had about five or six minutes at this stage. So you can see the muscles switching on and off in this region, how the thoracic and lumbar spine are coupled. How the limbs produce rotation. How the spine is stabilised for trot. So not a good gait for rehabilitation and suppling. And then the horse will transition to walk shortly. This is the thoracolumbar region marked here. And longissimus. And back to walk. rotation and another video of a horse jumping in slow motion with a rider and see how much activity and coordination of that activity is required and how the poles can educate the horse to use its limbs in a greater range of motion helping recruit rectus abdominis and stretching iliopsoas. So coordination, pushing from the hinds and you could see there how much coordination of the muscles is required in order for the horse to land and control the hind end over the jump. Testing the spinal joints and muscles can take some practice. A simple test to locate local restriction of the joints is to begin in the wither region, grasp the tail and use the other hand placed against an individual dorsal spinous process to anchor it. Then Flex the pelvis gently. Move to the adjacent dorsal spinous process and repeat. Use the bony part of the base of your hand as the anchor so as to be more focused against a dorsal spinous process and its segment. The dorsal spinous process under the hand should feel spongy as if moving within its ligamentous soft tissue. And there will be less lateral movement in the lumbar spine because of the transverse processes, but you should still be able to feel some sponginess. The restricted vertebrae will feel fixed instead of spongy, but be sure to get some practice in before you can confidently state your result. And I'll demonstrate this in a film shortly. Paniculus reflexes are helpful as active tests of range of motion. Getting the horse to lift in the lumbar region is performed by standing to the side and scratching near the tuber ischii, so about a hand's width or so from the tail. Although this can be done in the sacral region, avoid startling the horse with this by progressively applying pressure. So do this slowly and carefully to begin with. This can be done unilaterally, so just make one sweep down one side of the horse, then the other, and the horse should flex laterally, so you can compare that lateral flexion from side to side and see which side the horse is more restricted on. In the mid-back, 
scratch simultaneously where the points of the tree would lie and just above the opposite tuber coxa. So scratching in this direction, so towards the spine. Every time a scratch movement is made, the horse will make an S shaped curve. So a very gentle S as you can see in this horse. Alternate, so swap hands here to here and compare sides. Spinal extension can be tested by scratching just above each tuber coxa simultaneously. And this can indicate sciatic signs if the horse blocks this movement. Repeat the tests. Some may guard a second time if it's uncomfortable to flex or extend, and that's for all of these paniculus reflex tests. Do them twice because the horse may well guard uh, a region the second time if it's uncomfortable. Let's have a look at those moves on film. Anchor with your pies before. Now this depends, the size of the horse depends on your arm width as well, your arm span. You need long arms for this. So I'm going to start this. about here. Anchor a vertebrae. Get hold of the tail. <laughs> Let's move back a bit. So I'm just hooking under the tail and just lateral flexion. Lateral flexion. Yeah, one at a time. Like a snake movement. Like a snake movement. Anchor and flex. Anchor and flex. You won't get much in the lumbar, but you can still flex. Anchor and flex. Anchor and flex. Don't stand directly behind the horse. Just move to the side. This is a very good, strong lift. Textbook. And this is it from above. That's about as good as it gets. Who is this? And the unilateral version. Just you can get one a good hip. Lift and stretch on that. And this is making an S shape in the dorsal spine. Oh, that's quite good. You can see how I scratch firmly up towards the spine and the horse moves sideways at each end. To the left than the right. Mm. And extension. Lift. And showing you that the horse can it, it block the movement the when you try it again. And he's resisting it now, guarding completely. Finally, let's consider the rider's back musculature briefly. And the horse requires the rider to be stable and balanced. And the rider uses their back muscles primarily to sit still on the moving horse. That is not easy with four curves at play here, here, here and here. The spine is inherently unstable in this vertical position, especially when it has to remain vertical through the pelvis and contact with the seat of the saddle. The rider's spinal muscles are similar to those of the equine, except that quadratus lumborum with its origins on the last ribs and insertions into the pelvis because of the requirement for lumbar stability in movement. So these are the pink muscles, quadratus lumborum. When recruited unilaterally, it laterally flexes the rib cage at the waist and bilaterally it extends the lumbar spine and fixes the rib cage in an isometric contraction. Pelvic stability in the saddle will aid upper body support to maintain a vertical spine and adopting a neutral pelvis position will instantaneously reflexively recruit core muscles. 
This means that if the pelvis is positioned in the saddle in such a way as to help with recruitment of those muscles, the rider will be supremely stable in the saddle. Rectus abdominis and the external obliques are the core muscles of the rider. Finding and maintaining that position is, however, challenging for riders, but once found, their equitation skills can take on a whole new level in terms of making them easier for the horse to carry them with less noise from an aberrant body movement. Simultaneous engagement of erector spiny muscles will induce full core stability and in turn balance in movement. This will be covered in more detail in the biomechanics module. In the next presentation, we will explore the joints and muscles of the limbs.